Hello, good day everyone. Welcome back for another lesson. In this lesson, I will continue to talk about the periodic table, but I will focus on periods, groups, and valence electrons. So let's begin. So when we look at the structure of the periodic table, we can see numbers. Sometimes they appear, sometimes they're not there, but very often we can see numbers on the left-hand side. So in other words, the rows, so we're talking horizontally, the rows are numbered. And these numbers correspond to the number of energy levels or shells or orbits that the elements in that row have. So if we look at row number two, that contains lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. Well, all of these being in row number two, well, that means that they all have two energy levels. If you look over here, we have drawings of lithium. Lithium has two energy levels. Carbon has two energy levels as expected. So does fluorine and so does neon. So the row number, gives us the number of orbits for a given atom. Now we will also find numbers at the top of the columns. These columns are called groups. So we have here group number 1 or 1a, number 2 or 2a, 3 or 3b, and so on and so forth. So you can see that there are two systems, either 1 through 18, or sometimes you'll have one, two, three, all the way up to eight, A, but you'll, you'll also have a B section. Now, this section here, and I separated it with red lines, this section here we call the transition metals. So we know already that the yellow elements are the, the, the metals, the green elements are the semi-metals, and the blue ones are the non-metals. So these are the metals, are part of the metals group, but they are called transition metals. They have a different internal structure. They're much more complex. We will not talk about these. We're going to stick to the more, the, the simpler ones, the very straightforward ones. So elements from a same group will have similar chemical properties. In other words, they will react the same way in a chemical reaction. They may react uh, more violently, or some less violently, but essentially they will have the same behavior in a given re a chemical reaction if they are part of the same column or group. So they react the same way because they have the same number of what we call valence electrons. These electrons are called that way, have a special name, because they are found on the outermost shell. These are the ones that participate in a chemical reaction. So that's why they get a special name. Now, how do we know how many valence electrons an element or an atom has? Well, that's why the columns are numbered. Okay, These numbers correspond to the number of valence electrons that the elements in a given column or a given group will have. So if we take, for example, group number 2A, well, all these elements here will have two electrons on that last shell. Group 3A is indicating to us that all these elements have three valence electrons on their last shell. Group 8 would obviously have eight valence electrons on their last shell. So if we look at this diagram, we now know that the period number tells us how many shells or energy levels or orbits an atom has, and now we know that the group number tells us how many electrons we can find on the last shell, the outermost shell. So now we have two pieces of information. So period one, one shell, right? One shell. Period two, we have two shells, two, two shells, two shells. Period three, three orbits, three, three, and three. Now, those shells have different names. I told you already that the last one is called the valence shell because it contains the valence electrons. The, all the other shells in the middle that are in gray in these diagrams, these are called the core shells. They contain the core electrons. It's only the outermost shell that we're interested in, the valence shell, because 
that shell contains the electrons that participate in chemical reactions. So group 1A would have one valence electron. Group 4A, we have four valence electrons on each, for each element, one, two, three, four. Group 7A should have seven valence electrons, and they do, obviously. Two, four, six, seven. Group 8A should have eight valence electrons, except for helium. Helium is a special case. I'll get back to it in a second. But all the others would have eight valence electrons, two, four, six, and eight. The problem with helium is that it's a very small atom. It only has one shell. And you will learn very soon that each shell can contain a given amount of electrons. The first shell, being the smallest, can only contain two electrons. So we cannot go up to eight. We'll never find eight electrons on one shell, on the first shell, the one that's closest to the nucleus. So because it cannot contain eight, we can actually only fit two. Now I've just talked about helium that can only have two valence electrons versus all the other atoms can have up to eight. So why is this and how do we know um, to what extent an element or an atom will react chemically? Well, that's what I'm gonna talk about now. So an atom is stable when its outermost shell is full. What does this mean? Well, to reach stability, it can gain, lose, or share electrons through a chemical reaction. Okay, this is how atoms will form bonds and molecules. An atom's chemical reactivity depends on the number of valence electrons it has. And based on this number, we can determine how many electrons an atom will gain or lose or maybe share to get that full outer shell. The faster it can achieve its goal, the more reactive it will be. So there are two rules that are followed in order to, to have a full shell. There's the octet rule, octet means eight. So that means that an atom to be stable and have a full shell, or when they reach a full shell, they are stable, they stop reacting they will need to have eight electrons on that valence shell. Or there is a duet rule for the smaller atoms. Duet meaning two. These atoms will only end up with two electrons on their last shell. And that will make them stable. Okay, so that's a lot of information. Let me clarify this using this diagram again. So if we take a look at period three, Period three, in period three, the atoms have three shells and they have a certain number of valence electrons as per the group number as I specified before. So if I take, for example, group 17 or seven, period three. So I have chlorine. Chlorine has three shells and seven valence electrons. It wants to go up to eight, so it would need to gain one electron. How it will do that is that it's going to uh, steal an electron from another atom that maybe wants to give it up. So now that it stole an atom, so it gained an, uh, sorry, an electron from another atom, now it has eight valence electrons. It is now stable. So that's what we call the octet rule. Atoms want to have eight valence electrons and they will no longer be chemically reactive. By doing that, they acquire the electron configuration, so the way the electrons are divided, that's what we call electron configuration, they acquire the electron configuration of the closest atom that is positioned in group eight. So in this case, chlorine resembles argon. So it adopts the electronic configuration of argon. It doesn't turn into argon. It doesn't change the number of protons that it, that it has, but by gaining an electron, the electronic configuration will look like the electronic configuration of argon. So that's one way that atoms can become stable.
by gain elect gaining electrons. Now, if I take the case of sodium, sodium has one valence electron. It would need to gain seven in order to become stable, in order to fill out that outer shell. That's a lot of work. The easier path would be to get rid of that one electron. It could give it to chlorine, for example. Now, by giving away that one electron, which is much faster, well, then that shell would essentially disappear because it's no longer needed. Now, we are left with two shells. On the second shell, which becomes the outermost shell, I already have eight valence electrons. Again, eight valence electrons, octet rule. Okay, so atoms will either gain or lose electrons in order to obtain a full shell. And that full shell will contain eight electrons, and that's why we call it the octet rule. Now, there are a few exceptions to this, and they are listed here. These atoms, because they are small, will follow the duet rule. So if we take helium, I showed you before helium has only one shell. It is, it is a small shell. It can only contain two electrons. So helium is happy. It is stable with two electrons. That's it. That's all. If I take hydrogen, hydrogen has one valence electron. Well, it might want to acquire a second one, in which case it would adopt the electronic configuration of helium. Again, the number of protons inside the nucleus do not change, so hydrogen remains hydrogen. But it might gain an electron and look like helium in terms of electronic configuration. If I take lithium, lithium has also one valence electron. It will want to gain a second one, and a third one, and a fourth one, and a fifth one, and six, and seven, and eight. But that would be a lot of work. The easier way would be to just give away the one electron that it has, and this whole shell disappears, right? So atoms will want to do what's fastest and easiest. In this case, it's faster to lose one electron. It'll give it away to uh, fluorine or chlorine who might want to gain one. So by doing that, I only have one shell left, and that shell has two valence electrons. Duet. Two duet rule. Okay, so lithium will lose its extra electron and will keep only one shell with two electrons. So hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron are all atoms that will end up when they are stable with one shell, which will contain ultimately two electrons, and that makes them non-reactive chemically at that point. Now, where you might have uh, maybe a little bit of confusion is you might say, what do I do with an atom that has four valence electrons? Well, it could go either way, right? In theory, it could gain four electrons to go up to eight, or it could lose four electrons and just stick to the, the shell that's underneath. Same thing here. If, I, if this atom lost its four electrons, well, then that shell would disappear, and the shell underneath already has eight electrons. That could, in theory, work. What we observe is that very often um, elements from group four will tend to gain electrons more than they will lose electrons, or they might share electrons as well, which is a little bit like gaining them. When we talk about types of bonds uh, within chemical reactions, I will explain in what cases, in which cases atoms will gain or lose or share. But for the time being, just remember that atoms of group 14 or 4A, uh, they could go either way, gain or lose, because it's not more work to go one way or the other. But in general, what we actually observe is that they tend to uh, not lose their electrons, but rather gain and go up to eight. So in summary, what you should retain from this lesson is that the group number indicates how many valence electrons an element has. So those are the electrons on the last shell, exception made of helium here, which doesn't have eight but has two. And the period number indicates how many energy levels an element in that row should have. I hope this was clear. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. 
and it'll be my pleasure to help you out. All right, see you around for another lesson. Have a good one.